It's year four of the pandemic and if there's one thing that has changed during this period, it's the fact that a lot more people are trying to be aware of, trying to find out more about various aspects of healthcare, from medicines to even issues related to policy. We've seen, of course, health workers coming out onto the streets in larger numbers to defend their rights. And there's been a lot of discussion on issues such as vaccines, diagnostics, the right to access to healthcare, all these have come to the fore. And that's maybe one of the few positive things that has come out of this pandemic. But there's still a lot of aspects which are really behind the veil, so to speak, which are discussed in boardrooms, which don't really make it to the news so much, but which have a huge impact on our lives, on our health. Today we'll be talking about some of these aspects. We are joined by Jyotsna Singh of the People's Health Movement. Jyotsna has just been to the World Health Organization's Executive Board meeting which took place in Geneva. Thank you so much, Josna, for talking to us. Always a pleasure. So, Josna, just to sort of set the stage, could you maybe take us through why the Executive Board of the World Health Organization, why is it important? It sounds very bureaucraties. It sounds like a <laughs> committee. But why is it so important for you and me and for all of us? Absolutely. So, the thing is, WHO holds two meetings a year, which are very important because they're open to everyone to witness. It is live streamed, uh, civil society and health activists and other uh, uh, stakeholders in health can actually go uh, and be there. Uh, so it's, it's like a gala ceremony, so to speak, where the governments are there, the health ministers and the, if not the ministers, the health secretaries are definitely there. And then you have that space where you can directly talk to them, talk to the, the WHO officials who end up guiding a lot of policies, what we witness in our countries, um, and um, have a chit chat and see where, in which direction is the global health governance moving. Um, so, so these two meetings are one is the executive board which just happened in Geneva in the WHO headquarters. The other is World Health Assembly which is a much bigger version of this meeting uh, which uh, happens in the month of May. So in an ex executive board meeting uh, it is a limited number of countries who are part of the executive board of WHO and only they have the right to um, uh, vote and things like that whereas in WHO it is all the countries with right. equal participation. So, so these are the two. And uh, I mean, in between, there are a lot of meetings that happen, but everybody is not a party to it. It is fewer number of people. Right. So that's why they become important. Right. So just now, in the EB meetings that took place, and you were there, you talked to people over there. What do you think are some of the main things that you know, off the top of your head? What are some of the main things that sort of struck you as themes that were significant at this point of time? Right. Uh, so, uh, executive board meeting, uh, it discussed around 23 or 24 agenda items uh, this year, uh, starting from social determinants of health to universal health coverage uh, to uh, uh, budgets and the WHO is looking for more and more uh, money and funds. So all of these issues were discussed there. Behavioral science was another one. Uh, some of these issues are going to be reflected uh, in World Health Assembly also. Uh, so this was more, this is like a preparatory meeting. So, so that definitely was there and uh, um, but if you, I mean there are many interesting things that happen when you are there. You can see how the international politics uh, plays a role in itself because the Russia-Ukraine war was a theme that determined a lot of discussions throughout. So the Director General had uh, uh, made a report on health emergencies in which there was a mention, uh, I mean it was a detailed mention, not just a mention of the war uh, in Ukraine. And Russia completely disagreed with it. It said that we won't let this report pass uh, because it uh, it is so one-sided. And you could see the EU and other NATO uh, uh, countries coming together and saying, no, we agree with the report. So that is one thing that um, you really see. Um, the other part uh, would be, I think, uh, the way national politics in the countries is uh, also get reflected in these discussions. Uh, for example, I mean, it was in one sense amazing to see uh, the uh, Brazil declared Brazil is back, science is back, right. um, obviously taking uh, a satirical uh, jab on Bolsonaro's government who was very unscientific, so to speak, in uh, dealing with COVID-19, calling for hydroxychloroquine as the treatment for right. COVID and etc. So all of the, the, uh, that you see, US for example, uh, the kind of stances 
uh, it takes now compared to how it was doing during the Trump administration is different. U.S. clearly said that we stand for the rise of LGBTIQ plus communities. Uh, Trump administration was very much against it. Uh, the uh, the new uh, the government also said Biden's government. Uh, the language is much softer uh, in favor of uh, sex, uh, sexual and reproductive rights, uh, which was the opposite during uh, Trump administration right. again. So, so these are the kind of things that you really witnessed. And I believe you and said Colombia also. Colombia also had an interesting intervention. It it did. So, uh, so one of the. Uh, so civil society uh, constantly has been saying and we have been raising our voice saying that civil society is getting excluded more and more by the WHO and uh, the, uh, the amount of time that is given to us, the amount where we are made to sit within these uh, discussions, all of that has come uh, under attack by the civil society to WHO. Colombia, and obviously there has been a change in the government recently, it's so openly and a beautiful statement by Colombia saying that we need more uh, of civil society right. in the room and they should be included more. Um, so, so yeah, so all of these things, when you witness it is, um, it tells you uh, what is happening in the nations also and how Absolutely. it governs right. these global governance issues as well. Right. Uh, so, Josna, of course, now the meeting taking place, uh, like I said, this is the fourth year of the pandemic. Uh, various countries have taken various stances on how they view uh, you know, what the state of the pandemic is, so to speak. But generally, I think it's, uh, you know, they, there's a general feeling that the pandemic is now maybe a bit on, there's a bit of a downturn, so to speak. It's not over, of course, but it's not as pressing an issue as it was maybe in 2021 or even early 2022. Yeah. So, but how, the pandemic definitely must be casting a shadow on the World Health Organization's deliberations, on the deliberations of people who work in the health sector. So how did the EB actually, you know, how did the pandemic sort of figure in the discussions of the executive board? Um, throughout, I think um, uh, when the countries make their interventions, if you read all the reports uh, that are presented by the Director General, Dr. Tedros, uh, there is a constant reminder about COVID-19 pandemic and what we have learned. Uh, the the entire question of equity comes up again and again in all the deliberations uh, that happen. Um, so, so one can see that. Um, but I think the question is that have we, has WHO and have the developed countries actually learned from the pandemic or not? That uh, is a big question mark. Um, and I think the simple answer is no. Um, so, WHO is also discussing uh, the pandemic treaty. It is called the Global Architecture for Health Emergencies, uh, Preparedness, Response and Resilience. In short, pandemic treaty um, that is being called. Uh, there's a, a parallel process going on, which is amendment to IHR, which is the International Health Regulation 2005. Um, uh, so when the uh, agenda of health emergencies come, you can see people are responding and the countries and uh, civil society is responding to it. Uh, but it is important to mention that these two processes are happening simultaneously right. throughout uh, the year uh, in WHO. There is an intergovernmental negotiating body that has been formed to discuss the pandemic treaty. Um, and maybe if we can spend some time on this, uh, uh, these two things. Um, so IHR 2005 uh, has been in place since 2005, as the name suggests. But uh, uh, the developing countries actually started to ask for amendments in the light of uh, the pandemic, right. because one realized that, so health emergencies is not only about pandemic it would also be about uh, the recent earthquake in Turkey or uh, and Syria or uh, floods that we witnessed in Pakistan uh, but pandemic of course was at such a global scale and uh, there was such lack of equity in the response and how the developed countries and their big pharma pharmaceutical car companies and everybody dealt with it that uh, there was a need to make some amendments. So these proposals have come. And if you see uh, India, Bangladesh, uh, the Africa region, 47 countries are represented by that. Uh, they have made a, a, a detailed plea that how IHR should be amended so that we, if uh, we are in a similar situation later, people do not die of, right. uh, 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 of a, 
of uh, something for which the vaccines and medicines exist in some other part of the world. The point is, and then we talk about pandemic treaty. So how it came about um, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, European Union uh, and many other uh, developed countries, they proposed that we need to be ready for future pandemics. Uh, so we were still struggling, the developing countries were still struggling with the current pandemic. And the developed countries had, they had, of course, they had vaccinated um, majority of their population and they had the audacity to uh, go ahead and start discussing future pandemics. So there was at that point of time also a lot of opposition that how are you discussing the future pandemics? Can we re uh, deal with this one? Um, so it was a problem, but well, we have it now. So we have to discuss it. Um, and there also, if you see, um, uh, there is a zero draft mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the pandemic treaty that came about a few uh, days ago, earlier this month. Um, and uh, the, if you look at the preamble of the zero draft, it has all the correct language in it. Right. Equity is there. They talk about uh, health workforce and how they were overburdened and they should not be. It recognizes very clearly that uh, the internationally, we failed to respond to COVID-19 the way we should have. It says that 70% of the health workforce is women mm -hmm. and we should be taking care of that. It talks about community and community participation, everything. And then when you start to see the actual language which will determine the policy, none of these things appear there. There is, it looks like there is no learning from COVID-19 at all. You are still, uh, you are talking in the preamble about intellectual property barriers, but you are not giving a solution to it right. in that. So it is a huge problem the way zero draft is. It, uh, we have, uh, the, the, the proponents of it, the people who have written it, uh, have clearly not uh, really, taken into consideration what the poor countries have gone through during the pandemic. So the point is that we need to see the uh, IHR uh, uh, amendment process and the new proposal of pandemic treaty as parallel processes and look at both uh, very um, and fight for equality in both because the IHR is going to be the founding principles and the pandemic treaty is going to be a part of it because it is one part of the entire health emergencies mm -hmm. uh, domain, right? Um, um, so we need to look at both. Both are not in a good shape at the moment. Right. And, and and we can see developing countries fighting for it. Uh, it's just that uh, the kind of uh, experience we have had through TRIPS waiver, where in the mm. World Trade Organization, right. uh, despite so much of push, uh, the gain was much less. It wasn't just nothing, but it was much less. Uh, learning from that, the developing countries, I think, will have to put forth, uh, the. Uh, I mean, they have to set red lines right. at a very different level. Mm -hmm. um, so, But because if you see, the developing countries are asking for, in IHR uh, uh, amendments, a health system is strengthening. If you see what the developed countries are asking for, it is uh, asking for securitization. So this is also a classical debate in public health where the developed countries say surveillance. Mm -hmm. They focus more and more on, on surveillance, which means we will know when the pandemic is about to emerge, right. right? Developed countries are saying and have been saying that we need to focus on, on response also. If in a poor country it has happened and you know there is a possibility of an outbreak, uh, what do you do about that? Mm -hmm. Developed countries can uh, immediately go on producing vaccines and hoard the vaccines. What will happen to the rest of the world? So surveillance and response have to go uh, hand in hand together. We do not see that. We see 80% surveillance, 20% response. Absolutely. Huge problem. Uh, the other problem in these drafts that we are facing is there is no, um, you do not find access and benefit sharing. Now, what is it in very short that if uh, um, a, 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 rich, a pharmaceutical company uh, is able to make a vaccine or any medical product using uh, a pathogen that has emerged in some other country, and the country has shared it, and that is why this company is able to produce it, yeah. right? Then the the, uh, the sharing of the benefit should yeah. go to that community Absolutely. as well. For example, Ebola. If you the, have got the strain from West African nations, and you are uh, sitting in a developed country, you cannot say, I will not share the vaccine 
or the know-how with the Western African nations. And I will use it only when uh, Ebola comes to right. my uh, rich country. So, so that access and benefit sharing should happen. It is not happening. That discussion has been going on for a decade in WHO. It should also get reflected in this. Uh, so the health system is strengthening, access and benefit sharing, equity. These are the three things that the developing countries are fighting for in these two mechanisms. And there is a lot of opposition, obviously, to that. Long road to go for many of these countries. Uh, just interestingly, you mentioned when you started, you mentioned something about the behavioral sciences, yes. which, you know, it's always, uh, when, you hear, when you hear behavioral sciences, you always go, oh, okay. <laughs> is it? <laughs> the alarm <laughs> needs to sort of sound at this point. So could you maybe just take us through wh how that came up and who's behind that as well? Absolutely. Um, so uh, this was one of the agenda items and uh, many eyebrows were raised. Uh, uh, what is this about? Um, and one did not know where this agenda item came from. Uh, but well, it is not as simple. So the thing is behavioral uh, science. So WHO, uh, SPHM, we have, um, uh, we have a position that, you know, uh, the vertical uh, way of dealing with diseases is m problematic. You have to look at social determinants and the structural problems. You cannot go disease by disease. If you strengthen uh, public health systems overall, uh, you fight all the right. diseases together. So that has to be the approach. Now, this behavioral science is even a, f a further attack. It is uh, actually putting the entire onus on the individual to do or not to do, to make healthy choices and not make unhealthy choices. Um, so, and uh, this push seems to have come from the World Bank uh, and etc. because the World Bank and OECD countries in uh, for the past one decade almost, they have been working in the field of behavioral economics, which says that you uh, work on people's behavior. And then, uh, so in, in a supermarket, uh, put healthy items at a more uh, a prominent space and right. put uh, the junk item at some other place. The point is there should be no junk material or unhealthy material in the supermarkets and that regulation has to come from the governments. So it actually takes away your entire focus from regulating uh, the market uh, and the TNCs, the transnational corporations uh, and ensuring healthy food. Uh, so no regulation, but you leave it to the individual. And then if you don't make the correct choice, boss, we try it. Uh, so, so that is coming and uh, this kind of an approach is going to be a problem. And we know that the World Bank policies and the way World Bank deals with health uh, is a huge problem, the way OECD countries uh, look at it. Um, and if WHO starts to get influenced by that so much that it has an agenda item and they're spending time on it, uh, then we really need to sound caution there. Absolutely. So. Definitely not a very positive or, you know, not quite an alarming trend, in fact, actually, if okay. you think about it. Thank you so much, uh, Jyotsna, for speaking to us, for giving us, I think, a very concise and clear idea, you know, of what actually happens in these meetings, the, the, you know, breaking down some of these technical aspects. So thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. But keep watching News Click and People's Dispatch for more such videos on issues such as health, on issues such as policies in various aspects of life, but in a language, in a way that all of us are able to understand and act upon it.